Oh, hello everybody. Corporal Kirk Womack, 6th Indiana Infantry, reporting for duty. Well, I just uh, wanted to come to you today and uh, give you a video on Civil War shaving. You know, old straight razors, they, uh, we've come a long way from them. They still work pretty good, though, if you know how to use them. And I'm going to go over, uh, if you want to shave, you know, do a shave in camp to improve your impression, uh, what you need, what types of razors, straight razors, were accurate to the Civil War period, what kind of accoutrements like a shaving mug and shaving brush and all that were accurate, and I'm going to try to guide you through how to uh, improve your impression in that light. I haven't seen too many people do that in a, a encampment situation, so it would be a nice addition to anybody's uh, impression, whether Confederate or, uh, or Union. So anyway, I'm going to finish up my own shave here, and I will be back to talk to you at the end of the video and we'll see you in a little bit here okay we're back uh, on the table in front of you here is part of my razor collection uh, like many other things I collect I went a little crazy on these a while back so I have a bunch of them but on the left here are several razors that date from the Civil War period or a little bit before over here these two are examples of early a very late 19th century, early 20th century straight razors, and I'll get to that in a minute and show you the difference between the two of them. Uh, and these are uh, razor strops, and we're just going to go over all of these things. So, I'm going to start out with the razor. This right here is a pretty standard example of what a stri men's straight razor would have looked like in the mid 19th century. This one was made by the American Knife Company of Plymouth Hollow, Connecticut. And I know for a fact that this razor was made between the years of 1849 and 1865. Because in 1866, the town of Plymouth Hollow, Connecticut, changed its name to Thomaston, Connecticut, in honor of Seth Thomas, uh, the famous clockmaker, because that's the same town his factory was located in. So. This razor was made between 1849, the year the American Knife Company came about, and 1865, the year before they changed the name of the town to Thomaston. So that's a little bit unusual to find a razor or anything else for that matter that you can more or less definitely date to the war years or a little bit before, so that's nice. I shave with this. All of these over here are ones that I shave with on a regular basis. This is the one I was shaving with in the video uh, before. Um, Anyway, this is a, a good basic idea of what a men's straight razor looked like in the mid-19th century. It's a fairly heavy grind. You can look at the cross-section of the blade. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a pretty, it's pretty heavy. It's, it's not a hollow ground at all. And you can see the difference between this here and this is a good example. This is a late 19th century a razor made by John Heifer in Sheffield, England, and you can see the difference here. Let me get both of them side by side. You can see the difference. See the one in my left hand here is much thinner toward the edge of the blade. And this one is more of a wedge shape. The wedge shape is what you want to look for when you're choosing a razor for your Civil War impression if you want to be super nitpicky and precise about accuracy. The wedge razor was the most prevalent in the mid-19th century and before. After the mid-19th century you started seeing more of these hollow ground razors because they were, they were capable of taking a finer edge and they were um, easier to sharpen. They were quicker because there was less metal uh, to remove to get a fine edge on this than it would be on one of these. But this would have been the common razor that was available uh, generally to uh, the average soldier or anybody else for that matter. So first thing you want to look for is a, hall, a heavy wedge grind. Here's another one. See, same thing. It's almost like just a wedge, like a splitting a split maul almost. For you use a splitting wood, it's just a nice heavy grind without, with very little hollow hollowing on the sides of the blade. Uh, that one, that one's a nice one. You can see the fancy gold embossing on the, on the horn handle. That's another thing to look for. Uh, plain black horn handles or something with some fancy stuff on here. Uh, black horn handles were the most common 
scale is it scales are the proper term for that but uh, the most common material for razor scales at that time they also had uh, like just uh, like uh, bone scales this razor dates considerably before the civil war this is the 1820s 1830s this one has a little bit of an interesting story this was actually dug in connecticut uh, by a bottle digger. He was digging on his godfather's family farm and he found a box that had several razor sharpening hones and several razors and this was in it. As you can see it's pretty well, it's pretty pitted here and there, but um, he had it restored. He had somebody go in and, and uh, thin the scales down on either side then put uh, camel bone on the inside of the scales to uh, reinforce the original bone scales. It shaves pretty good. I, mean, I was impressed with it. I put a better edge on it after I got a hold of it. Um, yeah, the fellow who restored it for him uh, did a pretty good job, but I, I wanted it a little bit sharper than he made it, so I went ahead and fixed it up. But one of the ways you date these razors, because they made wedge razors all the way up into the 1920s. They still make them. There's custom makers that make these. Uh, you look at the tail. This right here, this little part sticking out, it's called the tail. When you open up the razor, you open it up like this. You put your pinky finger on the tail, put your three fingers there, and you put your thumb there. That's how you hold it. But the tail, I wish I had brought it up. I have a, a razor from around 1900, or 1900, around 1800. The tail sort of grew as time went on. The early razors from the Revolutionary War period didn't really have a tail at all. It was just maybe a tiny little stub sticking out about like that. And then over time the tail grew out slowly. So you look at the difference between this and this. It's just this had a little less of a tail on it so that dates it to an earlier period. And just Then the straight scales dated to an earlier period and the way the blade is ground all that. But that, it, that, that was considerably earlier um, so that would work for Civil War too. if you were bringing your, well, if you were an older feller, you would just bring that razor. Or if you were a younger feller, you would be, your dad would have given him his razor, what have you. But these three were all made around the, the Civil War period. This is a little bit different. This is called a frame back razor. You open it up, you see it has a thin, flat blade that is soldered into the spine here, and that's what gives it its strength and rigidity. That was made by Wustenholm, George Wustenholm. They were a famous maker of uh, booby knives around the time of the Civil War. You always see and hear, read about the Wustenholm uh, booby knives and pocket knives, but they made straight razors as well. And this one, this is a Civil War era. I'm not sure of the exact date. This uh, style was patented in 1850, and the patent date's right there on the uh, tang. So that's a that's a a little bit of a different style, and they're, they're a little bit hard to find. I don't I've not come across many of them, but uh, they're kind of neat and they're easy. To, they have the benefit they're easy to sharpen, like the hollow ground razors, but they um, are accurate to the Civil War period. So that's kind of a neat little uh, feature there. So if you can find one of those, they're hard to find in good shape because if they have any rust on them at all, they tend to the rest all you sometimes goes all the way through the blade. There's some pretty good pitting right there. I got uh, all of these razors except for this one right here. I actually got on eBay. That's what I, where I like to find these. Right? Well, no, I'm sorry. I found this one. I found this one uh, at a, a yard sale actually uh, right before I went to the Munfordville, Kentucky Civil War reenactment last uh, last fall. So that's that's a little bit different. But the rest of these I got on eBay except for this I bought from a feller in Connecticut. Um, you can find some good deals on these on eBay. Uh, I paid, uh, I think I paid $27 for this one. Um, <laughs> paid $7 for this one. Uh, and of course they didn't look like this when I bought them. I polished the blades and re repaired the scales and restored them. Um, but, uh, you can get some good deals if you're, if you're willing to do a little bit of work on them or if you know of somebody who can do it for you, you can get some good deals on these. And really, a lot of, you know, everybody goes and buys these cheap razors, the, the modern reproduction razors. A lot of them are junk. A lot of the razor guys call them razor-shaped objects. <laughs> they're, they're, they, 
the steel is such junk it cannot hold a good edge and you really can't sharpen them enough sharpen them well enough to shave with so honestly your best bet and and the modern wedge razors the modern uh, made wedge razors are generally very very expensive the good ones are there they can go as much as 250 300 dollars and most of what you run across are the hollow ground razors like these which if you're not too terribly worried about perfection you just want a straight razor to shave with that's fine but if you want to be real if you want to pay really good attention to detail you want to try to find a wedge a wedge razor um, uh, but anyway if you if you want to do get some authentic an original mid 19th century razor does not cost a whole awful lot if you know where to look and you look long enough and you don't you don't get in too big of a hurry so I would go with the originals if I were you but it's entirely up to you um, and now I know a lot of people are going to be talking about oh well they never shaved during the Civil War well they did shave. Now, they did not shave on campaign for obvious reasons. Now, some fellers might have, but I've never seen any uh, period uh, sources that are uh, yeah, period sources that have confirmed this. But I know they shaved because, well, for one thing, the men carried razors with them. They, they uh, made a list, the government made a list of, uh, or an inventory, if you will, of uh, the items that were recovered from uh, the dead at Gettysburg after the battle and uh, several straight razors were included in the inventory so you know that we know they carried them and you don't usually carry something at least not all the way up to the battle of Gettysburg <laughs> unless you're, you're actually using it if it was 1861 and you're just marching off to, to battle yeah I'm sure everybody carried a razor but I'm sure a lot of the guys grew beards uh, and a lot of the guys weren't old enough to shave but they, uh, some, some of the fellers did carry them. It was not extremely widespread, I don't personally believe, but I know some of them carried them. And I also suspect, and there are period accounts of uh, some of the fellers setting themselves up in per semi-permanent camps as the camp barber. And they would go to them and they would you know, get their hair cut or get a shave from them. And you know, a lot of guys back in the 19th century did not own a razor. A lot of fellas just went to the barber every day and got a shave, or every other day. Uh, not everybody was capable of or willing to maintain and learn how to use one of these because it is a pretty good investment in time and money. It was back then and it is today as well. Uh, so a good number of them went to the barber shop every day, and so they, that would be the type of type of person that would rely on the camp barber, or they would just grow a beard. And that's, of course, a lot what many of the fellers did, but uh, some of them did shave, and there are some period accounts of it. There was a letter I read, and I've been, I tried to find it. I tried to find the source for the video, and I couldn't find it. I'm going to keep looking, but I remember reading it about a year and a half ago, and it was a gentleman's diary. He was in a Pennsylvania regiment, and he wrote in his diary, having shaved for three days, or having shaved for five days. Several different instances in his diary, he wrote, having shaved for X number of days while he was on campaign. So some fellers did shave, and some, and obviously if they did it themselves, they carried the razors, because they didn't have a Gillette Mach 3 or a uh, double-edged safety razor to fall back on. This is what they had, and they didn't have anything else. So... That's what you want to look at for in a razor, a heavy wedge bl uh, grind on the blade, just a basic black, uh, not plastic, a black uh, uh, horn scales on there. If you find a uh, frame back like this, that's great, etc. So that's what you want to look for. Now, on to sharpening and maintaining. It took me quite a while to wrap my mind around how in the world they maintain their razors in the field because it's a pain in the neck to maintain these generally because you have to have something like this. This is a, a Thuringian sharpening stone uh, from Germany. Uh, the famous company who mined these was a Escher. I don't believe this is an Escher. I believe this is a off-brand, but uh, they were in business since the seven, late 1700s, so they, they mined these for many years and they shipped them all over the world, and this was the go-to stone for basically the whole world for years for sharpening uh, razors and all other fine like surgical instruments whatnot 
But if you drop it, it breaks. It's heavy. You're not going to be carrying this around with you in your knapsack or your pocket. It's just not practical. There's many other things that you could use far more. But without a stone, how are you going to sharpen it? And I had to do a lot of research and reasoning to figure that out. In the early to mid-19th century, they used what they called pasted strops. Okay, and now I'm sure you've seen the old movies where they had the strop, you know, Barbara had the strop and, psh, psh, you know, strop the razor like that. Well, these are 19th century paddle razor strops. This is a Atwoods, or Atwells, excuse me, Atwells improved elastic razor strop. Now, both of these strops are uh, post-war. This one was made after 1868, but both of these strops were manufactured with the same packaging and under the same names during the war and before. Anyway, this is the Atwell's razor strop. I have used this a couple times at reenactments, just for the fun of it, but it has a small drawer you pull out. That's what you put your razor in, and it has some abrasive paste right there for the strop, and what you would do is, if your razor got dull, you could flip it over, and you see it, I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's a little bit of a reddish color. That's a sharpening paste, so you would put your razor like this, and you'd do it just like so, just like you're stropping on a hanging strop, and the paste would sharpen up the edge of your razor. Oops. This razor does not have an edge on it. I have not gotten around to sharpening it yet. I just finished restoring it. But anyway, and it would give you it give your razor a nice edge. Now, if you were this would not sharpen your razor if it was completely dull or rusted. You'd have to use a stone for that. But uh, if just from everyday maintenance of the blade edge, this is what you'd use. And then after ev before every shave, you'd use just the clean leather side, just like so, and it would work fine. And the nice thing about this is, you put your razor right there in the drawer, put the protective cardboard sleeve over it, and you'd have a nice little, fairly relatively compact, this is about a foot, foot, three, foot to 12 to 14 inches long, so it's not too terribly long. Uh, and it would just fit right in your knapsack. This thing fits perfect in the knapsack. Um, so this was just a nice practical thing to use and it's all self-contained. You got your razor, you got your strop, you got your means of sharpening. So I've always liked this and I got this on eBay as well. Um, that's a, so that's a, that's a nice one. And this one is the Emerson, uh, the Charles Emerson razor strop. Now this one does not have the handy little razor drawer on it, but it's the same principle. You flip it over, you have the sharpening paste pasted side and then you flip it over and that's the everyday side which is the leather for straightening out the edge um, and the Charles Emerson patent strop was advertised as being sold since 1810 did some research and he they did in fact sell this strop from the very early 1800s is when he, it was patented all the way up until the early 1910s. And this is one of the later ones. This one's from the 1890s. But it retained the same form all that time because there really wasn't any way of improving on it. It was just a very basic thing, but it did its job and it did it very well. So that's how they would have maintained these razors in the field without one of these heavy sharpening stone, heavy fragile sharpening stones. So that made the ra carrying razors with them on the march a little bit more plausible to me, and it, it made, made a lot more sense. Um, and as far as a shaving brush, I don't have it with me. I couldn't find it. I have one, but um, it's just a basic wooden handle uh, shaving brush with natural bristles. Um, I know not many people like them too well, but uh, Nicholas Sakella. And Jay Sakella sells a very nice shaving brush uh, on his website for $23, I believe. I bought one from him, and believe it or not, he shipped it out real quick. So I, <laughs> I have never had a, a real problem with him, but that's, that's another conversation for another time. But anyway, it's a very nice brush. It's just a basic wooden handle brush, and it has uh, a wrapped uh, knot on it, a, a wrapped 
uh, bristle bristle brush on it. They wrapped the uh, bristle brush with uh, twine real tight on the outside of the brush. That's what makes it a little bit more authentic. That's how the originals look. The new ones are all glued in and all that. So, and he is the only one to, that, to my knowledge, that is making an authentic shaving brush right now. So you can check out his website, njsakella.com, for that. I think. Uh, to my knowledge. Now, if somebody else knows of someone where else that's selling them, uh, please let me know. But to my knowledge, he's the only one selling an authentic shaving brush. Now, shaving mugs, they were known to be carried, especially early in the war, but they're heavy. They weren't really practical. I have a replica tin shaving mug, and it's, it's fine, but it's not practical to carry. It takes up a lot of room in the knapsack, and this would be plenty to carry in the knapsack. So, what I suspect they did, and once again, I don't really have any historical, I don't have any uh, period accounts to back this up, but I suspect they just had the shaving soap. They would rub it on their face, and then they would get the shaving brush wet and lather the soap on their face. Um, now, in the modern day shaving, they have what's called a shave stick, and it's just a stick of shaving soap around. It looks like a gigantic... Uh, lip balm tube and you just get your face wet and rub the soap on your face and get your brush wet and lather your soap right on your face without worrying about a shaving mug. I suspect that's what they did um, because there are, once again, in that Gettysburg, uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg, the inventory of the items recovered from the bodies, they did uh, find, I believe, one or two shaving brushes, but no mention whatsoever of um, a shaving mug. So. Either they used their tin, their tin mess cup for a shaving mug, or they just rubbed the soap on their wet, got their face wet, rubbed the soap on their face, got their brush wet, lathered up on their face, and that's about it. Um, anyway, and one other thing, if you, I'm not going to get into how to sharpen these things or how to strop them or anything else because there's a lot of good channels on how to do that, and there's a lot of good information out there. I would highly recommend there's a YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Matt uh, uh, 357, uh, he is a uh, razor sharpener, and uh, he's actually the one who sharpened uh, these two razors for me. I Oh, no, I'm sorry, these three razors. I, I sent them off to him to sharpen them, uh, hone them, as he'd like to say, but he has some very good videos on there on how to hone yourself, what the stones you'll want to use how to strop your razor, how to shave with your razor. So he has really good videos. So I'd recommend him if you want to get into shaving with these things. Um, I enjoy shaving with them myself. It took a lot of doing it. It takes a good 50 to 100 shaves to get the hang of shaving with this without any irritation or cutting your, cutting your nose off or what have you. So, but I think it's well worth it. And if you have the time and inclination to learn it, it's a good way to have another connection with history and see how far we've come along in the shaving <laughs> the shaving uh, technology and any other technology for that matter. We've come a long way, but sometimes for some people, the old ways are still the best ways and I just happen to be one of them. So anyway, well, I'll see you in just a little bit here on the outside. If you have any questions, uh, uh, put them down below in the comments and I'll be right back. Thank you. No, you're back. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this is Private Kirk Womack, 6th Indiana Infantry, signing off again. And just remember, anything you can do to improve your impression, man, for inexpensive, is the way to go. You can learn, teach yourself to shave with one of these at events. And you, who knows, you might even enjoy starting to shave with it every day. But anyway, every anything, little thing you can do to improve your impression is a good way to go. But anyway... Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave a comment down below. Subscribe if you're new to this. and I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. I'm Probably in the next video I'll do is on a, what a, a soldier normally would carry in as a knapsack of private purchase items he would have brought with him. But anyway, it'll be fun. Anyway, this is Kirk Womack signing off. You have a wonderful day today, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.